Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone Chapter 2 The Vanishing Glass Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find the nephew on the front step, but Trivet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby. And now the photograph showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His aunt Petunia was awake and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up! Now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling he had had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon. And don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Daddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember and the first question he could ever remember asking his aunt Petunia was how he had gotten it. In the car crash when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a hacker. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together. But it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. 
He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. On Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's present. See, it's here under this big one for Mommy and Daddy. All right, thirty-seven then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible, in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger too, because she said quickly, "And we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today." How's that, Popkin? Two more presents? Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, "So I'll have thirty, thirty, thirty-nine sweetums," said Aunt Petunia. Oh. Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. Out the boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it. While Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote-controlled airplane, sixteen new computer games, and a VCR, he was ripping the paper off a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone, looking both angry and worried. "Bad news, Vernon," she said. "Mrs. Fix broken her leg. She can't take him." She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he had planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibble, Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge," Uncle Vernon suggested. "Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy." The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. "What about what's her name? Your friend, Ivan, on vacation in Majorca," snapped Aunt Petunia. "You could just leave me here," Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change, and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she had just swallowed a lemon, and come back and find the house in ruins. She snarled. "I won't blow up the house," said Harry, but they weren't listening. "I suppose we could take him to the zoo," said Aunt Petunia slowly, "and leave him in the car." That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Daddy Dums, don't cry. Mummy won't let him spoil a special day. She cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to come. Dudley yelled between huge, pretended sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord! They're here," 
said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pierce Polkis, walked in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs when Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley, on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they had left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he had said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy, any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia tired of Harry coming back from the barbers looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short, he was almost bald except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. Next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had shared it off. He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he had gotten into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, he, he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he had tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jumped behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to be spending the day somewhere that was in school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Fig's cappy-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things, people at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the blank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said, as a motorcycle overtook them. I had to dream about a motorcycle, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beat with a moustache. Motorcycles don't fly. Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way it shouldn't, no matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon. They seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Piers large chocolate ice creams at the entrance and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either. 
Harry thought, looking at as they watched a gorilla scratching its head, who looked remarkably like Dudley. Except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little way apart from the Dursleys, so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top, Uncle Vernon bought him another one and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterward that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crashed it into a trash can. But at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least, he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head toward Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from, anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at the little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa constrictor, brazel. Was his knife there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil? As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mr. Dursley! Come and look at the snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came battling toward them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn, a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock, but the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. 
But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten off his leg, while Pierce, for sparing it, had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, Go, cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into a chair, and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking into the kitchen for some food. He had lived with the Dursleys almost ten years, ten miserable years, as long as he could remember, ever since he'd been a baby and his parents had died in the car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them. And of course, he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamt and dreamt of some unknown relation coming to take him away. But it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in a violet top hat had bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed him out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old woman dressed all in green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang.